When Mitsuo Fushida broadcasts Torah, 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 the second wave of Japanese planes, 167 strong, was around halfway to Oahu from their carriers. In a few minutes, they'll arrive. At this point in time, just as the first wave attack was almost ending, the second wave squadrons of 167 planes, led by Lieutenant Commander Shikekazu Shimazaki, was joining the battle. While I had the first wave squadron return to their motherships, my plane alone from the first wave remained in the sky above Pearl Harbor. My role was to provide battle instructions to the second wave squadrons as well as to provide surveillance of our achievements. Shimazaki reached Kohaku Point at 8.40 a.m. and gave the command for deployment. The first wave was the shock wave. The second wave is coming in to finish the job. No torpedo bombers, more dive bombers. The submarine spotted by the Curtis two minutes ago is now surfacing, damaged. Curtis blows a hole through the sub's conning tower with a five-inch shell, killing its captain, decapitating him apparently. Monaghan rams the sub and runs over it, dropping two depth charges in the process. The destroyer is lifted out of the water by the resultant explosion, which rips the submarine apart. Monaghan makes full speed ahead to clear another ship, but with too little space to maneuver, she hits a derrick and gets entangled with her mooring line. Backing out slowly, she manages to disentangle and head out to sea as the nearby ships erupt in cheers. If you were wondering when that sub entered Pearl Harbor, the answer is any time since 4.58 a.m. In the first episode, I said that was when the harbor gate was left open. Only now, at 8.40, is it closed. Well, a minute ago. And two minutes ago, four bombs splashed close aboard between the bow and the northern key of Berth F2, showering California with lethal fragments that slice into the starboard upper structure. Before the planes from Fuchida's first wave returned to their carriers one by one, they dropped their last bombs. Less than half an hour ago, the oiler Neosho was struggling to get herself free from the battleships to not endanger them even more should she become a target for those bombs. She is now sailing and making for Mary's Point while continuing to fire her AA guns at the straggler planes above. At the back of Battleship Row, Nevada has built up enough steam to get underway while she too continues to fire her guns at the enemy. She has to back up first though to clear passage ahead with enough distance from her burning sisters and the oil all around them. The desperate attempts to quell the fires and save men out of the water continue, but the thick smoke, the debris, and the falling bombs makes the work extremely difficult and extremely dangerous. The hospital ship Solace, originally moored at the north end of Ford Island, has now reached berth X-13 and reports she is in the clear. She now starts collecting wounded sailors in trips to the wrecks. On the California, Engineering crewmen are busy lighting off the four after boilers with cold oil and natural draft and restore light, power, and pressure on the fire main about 845. The crew starts trying to ready the ship despite her damage. Tangier sights another sub and fires at her, but it slips away. All in all, the Japanese have released 11 midget submarines, out of which four have managed to enter the harbor. The one stuck on the beach has now been discovered and the crew is captured. The Monaghan just sunk a second. Four more have been sunk in the open sea, sending their two-man crews to a watery grave. The midget submarine operation has not been a success. None of them has even fired their torpedoes. None has provided meaningful intelligence. Had the Americans not failed to coordinate their communications, they also would have wrecked the surprise. If anything, they've been target practice and a morale boost for US sailors. The second wave of Japanese planes is now 10 minutes out. Like the first wave, the second wave flies at staggered altitudes. This gives them more maneuverability and will help in intercepting any enemy planes they encounter. 54 high-level bombers at 11,000 feet are up on the starboard wing. These are divided in half. The 27 planes of Shimazaki's sixth group will hit Hickam, while 18 planes from Ishihara's seventh group will attack Ford Island, and nine will attack Kaneohe. At 10,000 feet, slightly to port, are Agusa's 78 dive bombers. They're in four groups, but are going to concentrate on the ships. 
Shindo has his Zeros flying high above the bombers. The nine Zeros headed for Kaneohe to destroy what remains of the 36 PBY Catalina stationed there, there are also four in the hangar, are led by 28-year-old Lieutenant Fusata Ida, a veteran of the Sino-Japanese War. Ida is a firm believer in the old Japanese military tradition of death before dishonor. On his initiative, the pilots have made a pact. If a pilot is unable to return to the carriers, he will not bail out, but crash his plane into an enemy target. The pilots of the second wave may have an easier job to hit the already crippled ground targets, but they might have a tougher job in the skies, since the Americans are soon able to scramble at least some planes into the air. Three of those pilots, now about to be airborne, are 1st Lieutenant Rogers and 2nd Lieutenants Brown and Danes. They have followed Welch and Taylor's example and gone to Halewa and are about to go up in two P-36s and a P-40. Welch and Taylor themselves are now at Wheeler, preparing to go up once again. Also there, Sanders, Rasmussen, Thacker and Norris's planes are finally almost ready for takeoff. Gordon Sterling continues to assist the other pilots and the armaments crew. A stone's throw away at Schofield, more and more of the wounded are being delivered to the medical station. Gordon's fiance Peggy has just returned from the pharmacy where she was sent to get more morphine. Everything seemed organized. Patients got out of bed and helped us. We got extra cots and put them down and put the beds close together so we could hold more patients. In time of disaster, you'd be surprised how people will help out. We had a lot with their legs shot and with abdominal wounds caused by bomb fragments. At Pearl, more and more ships are trying to get to open water to fight back against the aerial attacks, to search for the enemy fleet, or to hunt for more subs. Monaghan and Dale have now cleared the harbor entrance and go out to sea to do exactly that. Nevada is now under steam and heading towards the entrance. It is thanks to the caution of one man that this is possible. Officer of the deck this morning is Ensign Joe Tausig, son of the Admiral of that name. His regular duty is to lead the ship's anti-aircraft response. He's been one of the few officers at Pearl actively worried about aerial attacks and the ability of a battleship to fight them off, or as he himself puts it, We can man, fire, and reload our guns at a rate of speed which people not involved would not believe possible. But I can testify with vim, vigor, and conviction we couldn't hit the broad side of a barn, except at point-blank range. To get enough steam up to move one of these floating juggernauts takes hours though, and although one boiler is always run even in port to stay under power, that's not enough to move the ship. With an abundance of just-in-case earlier this morning, Tausig had a second boiler lit. This is what now enables the huge ship to start moving despite a fair amount of damage from the first wave. Tausig himself now lays seriously wounded from the first wave in a stretcher near the starboard anti-aircraft director. And in this lull of occasional bombs, lone zeros making a final run, there is a general shift among the defenders from total confusion to hard resolve. After the fact, many will remember the sight of the battleship Nevada wounded but still steaming towards the entrance as the trigger for this change of mood. Rogers, Brown and Danes are now taking to the skies at Halewa. At Wheeler, Sanders' squad is also ready to go. While strapping in, Norris realizes his parachute is defective. He jumps out to get a new one, leaving the engines running. Gordon Sterling is nearby. He seizes the moment and jumps into Norris's plane. As he straps in, he takes off his wristwatch and gives it to the armaments crew chief and says, see that my mother gets this, I won't be coming back. In bursts, the four planes race across the runway, climb steeply, bank, circle the airfield, and then head off in formation towards Kaneohe. At the medical stations, the wounded just keep pouring in. Peggy Olsen says, They had the wounded on hospital litters up and down the hall. It was all red, nothing but a bloody mess. The grimmest part is in triage, where they have to decide who lives and who dies. Aboard Solace, now anchored among the destroyers, hoping for protection from their AA guns, triage takes place on deck. Below deck, the worst burn cases are given morphine, with the nurses using lipstick to mark their foreheads with an M.
Ambassador Nomura is now received by Hull in Washington and gives him the note that he was supposed to give him an hour and 20 minutes ago. But war has already begun. Hull reads it and says to Nomura, I must say that in all my conversations with you during the last nine months, I have never uttered one word of untruth. This is borne out absolutely by the record. In all my 50 years of public service, I have never seen a document that was more crowded with infamous falsehoods and distortions on a scale so huge that I never imagined until today that any government on this planet was capable of uttering them. At Pearl Harbor, the first flights of the second wave are now arriving, circling at high altitude, waiting for Shimazaki's order to attack. But even as the men on the boats and the ground brace for another attack, those stragglers from the first wave keep attacking. There is simply no rest. On the West Virginia, things continue to deteriorate. Fire is raging in, on, and around her. But she's also filling up with water. An abandoned ship has been ordered. Ensign Victor Delano is now the ranking officer on board. He has sent everyone else he could find over to help the Tennessee beside them. On the bridge, Delano finds a helmet, puts it on, and checks two idle machine guns mounted in front of the conning tower. He grabs a young officer, a seaman, and a mess attendant to get them going. They do and begin blazing away. Across the channel at the docks of the Navy Yard, tugs finally begin pulling the crippled Oglala clear of Helena. The destroyer Mugford now has gathered steam and cast off, ready to fire back. The destroyer Farragut reports that she is underway, maintaining continuous fire with the main battery and machine guns when planes are within range. Destroyer Henley clears the entrance boys and is now ready for combat. It has now been more than an hour since the attacks on Oahu began. Over a thousand Americans have died, but outside of Hawaii and certain members of the American and Japanese military and their governments, the world still does not know. As the attack began, the American Hawaiian military seized control of all telephone and telegraph lines to make sure they can stay in communication with the mainland. Any reporters in Honolulu and all civilians have no way to get in touch with the outer world. At 8.52 Honolulu time, 2.22 in Washington, D.C., White House Press Secretary Stephen Early steps in front of an unsuspecting press corps. The reporters are shocked by the news, and as soon as Early has read the brief, a stampede of journalists rushes to the phones, cigarettes still hanging in their mouths, to call in the news. This is how the Associated Press cables the news to the world. Flash, Washington. White House says Japs attack Pearl Harbor. Bullets in Washington, December 7th. President Roosevelt said in a statement today that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii from the air. The attack of the Japanese also was made on all naval and military activities on the island of Oahu. The president's brief statement was read to reporters by Stephen Early, presidential secretary. No further details were given immediately. At the time of the White House announcement, the Japanese ambassadors Kishisaburo Nomura and Saburo Kurusu were at the State Department. Let me point out that the Japanese ambassadors themselves only find out about the attack from Secretary Hull right now. The messages from Tokyo give them to understand the extreme gravity of the note they are asked to deliver, but in all honesty, they do not know exactly why they are at State Department. Even Japan's Axis allies find out from the news. Sure, there have been rumors, but I'll get back to why they haven't been heated later. Because right now, there are more pressing things. The second wave under Shimazaki attacks now. Fujita observes from above. Upon this command of attack, 78 dive bombers led by Lieutenant Commander Igusa rushed to join forces from the east of Pearl Harbor. At that time, Pearl Harbor was covered with black smoke, and this hindered our visibility. Fearless, Agus has started to dive against the funnel of concentrated anti-aircraft barrages shooting up through the black smoke. As he came down through the smoke, he clearly see the ship that was firing at him, and then he bombed it. There is a proverb that says, the pheasant would not be shot but for its cries. Seeing that Shimazaki is handling the situation according to plan, Fujita stays back and lets him take the lead. 
At Kaneohe, Lita's group now circles the station briefly, eyes wide for any intact Catalinas. There aren't many, but the group dives in for the attack to destroy the remaining planes. It's over almost immediately, but Lita makes another run, strafing the armory. One of the soldiers guarding the station steps out of a side door of the armory, firing at Lita with an M19 machine gun. He hits Lita's wing as Lita swoops out of his dive. While his group is already heading out away from the station, Lita rolls and dives again, now heading straight for the Marine. Both men fire again. The bullets burst into the ground and walls around the American, but not a single one hits. The soldier empties his magazine in Lita's direction, hitting his plane several times. Lita swoops in and up, but breaks off the engagement and speeds away after his buddies. As he overtakes them to take the lead again, his engine starts to sputter and white flames pour out along the plane's side. One of the flight leaders under Lita is a young pilot, his protege Iozo Fujita. It's his first combat mission. They lock eyes. Either pointed to the remaining planes in the squadron, then northward in the direction of the carriers, then to himself, and finally to the ground. The message was clear to me. The squadron leader was ordering us to return to the task force while he would hold to our agreement. And then he waved goodbye. There was no change of expression on his face. He was very calm. Lita turns back and aims his plane straight for the armory. The astonished soldier grabs a rifle and fires frantically at Lita. Whether he hits him is unclear. But as Lita races in, barely above the ground, his plane glances off the pavement, spins to the side, and crashes into an earth embankment. The sudden stop flips the plane and shatters Lita's body into pieces. Fujita, in fury, decides to ignore his friend and comrade's order and stay and keep fighting. He and five other Zeros head for Wheeler. When Sanders' squadron arrives at Kaneohe, they are gone. Sanders circles the bay looking for something to fight and is then redirected towards Bellows. Mine layer Ramsey is underway proceeding out of the harbor to assume anti-submarine patrol on the clearing channel. The dive bombers are now coming down to the dry docks. In dock number two, destroyer Downs is hit and catches fire. Abandoned ship is ordered. Tangier spots more submarines, but is itself under heavy fire and cannot pursue. Among the destroyers in the north end of the harbor, the Zero pilots are flying in as close as they can to the Solace, apparently hoping that the hospital ship will protect them from AA fire. From there, they fan out among the destroyers to strafe the ships and distract the men manning the AA batteries before the dive bombers come in from above. Nevada is edging closer and closer to the harbor entrance and nears a floating dry dock holding the destroyer Shaw, which is ablaze. On the other remaining battleship, California, the efforts to mount steam continue. Both Shimazaki and Fuchida notice Nevada picking up steam. Not only is she one of the main prizes, her current direction gives them an idea for a coup de grace for the entire harbor. They think that if they can sink her right in the entrance, she will block it. That would make Pearl Harbor unusable for months while they try to salvage the massive hulk of a ship. Well, they're wrong. The harbor entrance is deep enough and wide enough that it would still be navigable, but the ship would be lost. The dive bombers move in and the first bomb hits. Now, the Nevada has a rather unlikely commander on this day. Lieutenant Commander Francis Thomas, the damage control officer. Yeah, it's ironic. I know. He is seventh in line for command, but as the senior officer aboard when the attack begins, it's his ship. Thomas graduated Annapolis in 1925 and served on a cruiser in China and the Philippines. Then he went to Washington, D.C. as a research officer at the Naval Research Laboratory where he worked on the project to develop sonar. After a brief pause in his service, he enters the reserves and is put on active duty on Nevada. As the torpedoes started to hit Battleship Row, he's far below deck at his station in the damage control center. He doesn't hear or feel the impacts on the neighboring ships, not even the explosion of the Arizona. With the help 
of Tausig's prescient decision to light off a second boiler, it is thanks to Thomas that the ship is sailing at all. Despite no tugboats to help and several jammed anchors, he manages to back her out into the channel and away. When they finally do get underway, he is shocked by the sight of the upside down Oklahoma and that he can feel the heat from the burning wreck of the Arizona even in the middle of the channel. On the battleship California, a bomb, possibly a battleship armor-piercing shell, now strikes the upper deck abreast of casemate number one. The bomb tears through the ship into her vitals, ricochets from the second deck inboard and explodes inside. The blast ruptures the forward and aft bulkheads of the compartment, as well as the overhead of A705 and springs the armored hatch leading into the machine shop, which men could not close again. The bomb completely destroys the watertight integrity of the first and second decks between frames 26 and 100 approximately, and between the second deck and the machinery spaces. In other words, California is going nowhere. Six of the SBD naval scout planes from Enterprise come in now to land at Ford. They're among the lucky ones out of the 18 that took off from Enterprise. Eight have now been downed. The second wave has once again turned the skies over Oahu into a deadly hornet's nest. Welch and Taylor are about to feel their sting as they take off again from Wheeler. Welch gets up just before a group of Japanese vows can come down on them. But the Japanese are coming in, in a row, strafing right above the runway, straight towards Taylor. But Taylor does not abort. Instead, he rushes through the oncoming bullets, aiming to get up into a position to fire at the last enemy plane. But he's mistaken. There's another vow behind that one, which now opens fire on him as he is climbing. He takes a bullet to the left arm and shrapnel to his leg while he pulls his plane into a desperate climb. Welch descends on the tail of the attacker and opens fire while the rear gunner of the Val fires back, hitting his engine, propeller and cowling. But Welch's bullets hit true and the Val plummets to the ground. Taylor joins Welch to pursue the rest, chasing them away from the field. Welch scores yet another hit before they have to return to Wheeler once again out of ammunition and Taylor out for the day, wounded. More and more bombs drop at Pearl on the rescuers and defenders. The Oglala is now clear of the Helena, but still sinking. Nevada is still heading for the entrance, as Fujita hopes, and Shimazaki has directed dozens of dive bombers to now focus their attentions on her, and they come down on her with increasing ferocity before she can clear the harbor. Another group of Zeros are now attacking at Bellows. There, three pilots, Christensen, Whiteman, and Bishop, have been preparing to get airborne. As the bullets hail down, they sprint for their planes. Christensen is strafed and killed as he's climbing into his P-40B. Whiteman and Bishop manage to take off, but before Whiteman even gets 100 feet into the air, a Zero shoots him down, killing him. Bishop in his P-40 manages to climb to 800 feet, but he is then hit and crashes into the ocean where he is somehow able to get out of his plane and swim ashore. The Zero Group turns towards Wheeler Field. Another five bombs have hit the Nevada. One explodes over the cruise galley. Another hits the port director platform and explodes on the upper deck. Yet another strikes near number one turret and blows large holes in the upper and main decks. Two strike the forecastle. One passes out through the side of the second deck before exploding, but the other explodes within the ship near the gasoline tank and sets off intense fires around the ship. Luckily, the ship's main magazine is empty, since all heavy artillery projectiles have been removed and were set to be replaced by a new type of charge later today. The ship sets deeper at the bow and is listing heavily, and to Thomas, it is now clear that he is about to lose the ship in deep water. She is abreast of the blazing floating dry dock. If she sinks here, she will slip into the middle of the deep waters of the entrance and salvage will be impossible. Grounding her would control the damage and Thomas now heads for the shallows at Hospital Point. With Taustig wounded and the communication cables from the director severed, his men operate the guns locally, manually, and with brute force. They fire round after round at the incoming planes, but as Taustig predicted, they mostly miss. One of them, Ensign Thomas Taylor, wounded, burned, and deafened when a blast ruptures his eardrums, continues to command the port anti-aircraft battery. 
At one point, the flames turn a pile of ammunition boxes red hot. With a hose, he cools them and stops an explosion. Many others die at their posts, burnt or blown to pieces. By now, there are so many holes in the ship that it will be impossible to determine exactly how many times she is hit. On the battleship California, a fire erupts below the main deck as a result of the bomb explosion. At the destroyer group, a VAL piloted by Lieutenant Mamoru Suzuki comes under heavy fire from the Curtis, Rally, and other vessels, severely damaging the plane. In what looks like another suicide run, Suzuki takes his plane down into Curtis's number one boat crane on the starboard side. The plane disintegrates, the gas tank explodes, and the tender is now in serious danger from the resulting blaze. Oglala has now capsized and sunk, but as she was freed, she does not pull down the Helena with her. The Nevada still has not reached the relative safety of shallower waters. To get there, Thomas has to clear the dry dock holding the burning shaw. On top of that, the ship must be secured on the shallows. To do so, someone has to brave the hail of bombs and bullets, cross the deck, and release the forward anchor, which has been jammed by a bomb strike. More dive bombers now come down on the dry docks, aiming for the Pennsylvania. One heavy bomb hits the destroyer downs in the dock ahead of Pennsylvania, that is also hit just after. The bomb passes through the boat deck and detonates in the number five gun of the number nine casemate, killing the men manning the guns. Nevada now slips right past the burning Shaw, barely clearing her aft. On deck, Chief Boson Edwin Hill is racing between the incoming bullets and explosions to reach that forward anchor. Hill was the one that cast Nevada off from the dock, but instead of staying behind, he dove into the water, swam across to the ship, and climbed up a mooring line. When the ship grates onto the shallows at 9.10, Hill has reached the anchor and releases it, securing the crippled ship just off Hospital Point. In the final assault, before the attackers fly away, Hill is killed. The following message is now broadcast to all local US forces. All hands, cease firing on B-17s attempting to land at Hickam. See, several of them are, in fact, still in the air, having taken detours on their way in to evade the attackers. As we've seen, they have no other place they can land than Hickam. But getting there is not just getting through the enemy planes, it also means getting through a barrage of friendly fire that goes up against anyone, really, friend or foe, who passes through the sky at this point. It's an effect not just of the adrenaline and the famous fog of war, but also the literal fog created by the hundreds of fires sending smoke billowing through the air. Try to imagine it from above Pearl Harbor. All across the lagoon, at Hickam and Ava, ships, houses, planes, and oil spills are all ablaze. Smoke also rises from Wheeler, Kaneohe, and Bellows. This is what Fuchida sees when he notes. Next, we focused on confirming the battle results concerning the destruction of the enemy's air power. I looked around each airbase. Every one of them was engulfed in billowing black smoke. But I knew perfectly well that a gasoline fire exaggerated the burnt landscape so that the impression is of total destruction. As I looked carefully trying not to be deceived, I failed to reach any hard conclusion. However, I judged that we had destroyed the enemy's entire air capability based on the fact that not a single enemy plane dared intercept us above Pearl Harbor for as long as three hours. He's right. Despite the heroics of single pilots, on a tactical level, the American airmen are not denting the actual attack. For those Japanese airmen actually having to face off with their American counterparts, that is little consolation. Like for Fujita, who is now speeding towards Wheeler and about to merge with the group of Zeros that attacked Bellows. But now, they are spotted by Sanders, Gordon, Thacker, and Sterling coming in far above them. Sanders' group circles briefly to make sure they are enemy aircraft. When he is certain, Sanders signals the others and they descend on Fujita and his Zeros. It's 9.09 a.m. The Japanese attack has now been going on for less than 75 minutes. The world is now finding out about the massive scale of the destruction they have brought down on Hawaii. Ships, planes, hangars, buildings, human lives obliterated. 
But although the Americans have not stood a fighting chance so far, and despite the killing blow the Japanese have tried to give the U.S. forces on Oahu, those forces are not knocked out. Although desperate and not a danger to the Japanese attack, it seems that the more that is thrown at the Americans, the more determined they become. If this is how the war will continue, this is not a good sign for Hideki Tojo. Thank you.